Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Henry Grossack, Principal of uh, Berwick Lodge Primary School, and uh, it's an honour and a pleasure to be uh, moderating this, I think, innovative and very valuable uh, seminar a discussion group uh, on some case studies done by some schools uh, under the uh, auspices of the Grattan Institute on Making Time, uh, which is uh, all about uh, school leaders tackling the challenges of teacher workload. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation, the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm on today, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. We've got a great panel uh, uh, people. Uh, we have Sonia Loudon, who's the Assistant Principal of Elevation Secondary College, uh, Reed Smith, who's the Head of Curriculum Ballarat and Clarendon College, Adam Bright, who's the Principal of Docklands Primary School. Uh, they all participated in the case studies and uh, I'm really thrilled to have Amy Haywood, who's the Senior Associate at the Grattan Institute, uh, a school education uh, and it's a great time for us tonight. We've we'll, uh, got a very interesting format. Uh, Amy will start uh, and she will give you a, a bit of an overview of the Making Time for Great Teaching project that the Grattan Institute um, have uh, been uh, running and uh, following that there'll be a few questions and we've got each of the case study speakers who will present for five minutes on their case study and uh, that'll be followed by some interactive Q&A between the panel members. Of course, if you've got a question out there, um, we'd love to hear from you and uh, we'll put that to the panel people when we get through that. Uh, it's about 30 minutes. We'll then have a, a general summary overview Q&A and ABA Haywood will finish off by uh, summarising the, the, uh, the evening's events. So once again, thank you for taking the time to join us. And uh, I'm sure this will be a very valuable experience for all of you. It certainly will be for me too, as a school principal, I'm always looking for new ideas on how we can uh, find the time for, and make the time for great teaching. On that note, I'll hand over to Amy Hayward. Welcome, Amy. Thank you so much, Henry, and thank you for agreeing to moderate this panel. I will not talk for very long. I just want to give a bit of an overview of the research that's brought us here and then really spend time listening to the school leaders who've helped us with that research. So uh, the research that we've done is part of this Making Time for Great Teaching project. In January this year, we released two reports. That one on the left is the policy report for policy decision makers. And on the one on the right, which might interest people in the audience is our guide for principals where we've synthesized what we found. Now, we this does actually build off the back of some research that we did in 2014, looking at particularly admin burden and reducing it in schools. And surprise, surprise, we have not from that one piece of research solved teacher workload issues in schools. So we thought it was definitely worth coming back to. But particularly in this instance, we were interested in the drivers and the things that are adding to workload pressures and what are the options for change or reform at a system level, but also at a school level, because we really saw that teachers are struggling. They're having a hard time getting to some of the core parts of their job. And that struggle is also felt by students in schools as well. So we felt that it was worth having another look at. So in terms of uh, what, how we've been thinking about school workload, we did ask ourselves the question of how did we get here? And we realised through talking with a lot of school educators and looking at the literature that we are expecting a lot more of schools and teachers today. So that it, people in the audience might be familiar with, you know, this increasing breadth of what we're expecting schools can do in terms of what they'll deliver, things like respectful relationships, swim safety, et cetera, but also in terms of our expectations of what effective teaching looks like. So teaching has become a more clinical, diagnostic, um, data-driven profession as well. And some of those central supports have changed over time too. So the research that we did uh, drew on a few different data sources. Uh, we did a really big survey. We had a huge response. Over 5,000 teachers responded to our survey and over 400 school leaders. We also did a number of focus groups and case studies. There are five of which are in the report reports that we've put out. As part of that survey, I suppose the key findings that we found, which 
might not surprise some people were that 92% of teachers said they don't have time for effective teaching. So that's the core part of their role, which was really worrying to us. I Further to that, 86% said that the workload for effective teaching was too high, that uh, 74% said that they didn't get enough support to help those struggling students or students with complex needs, and 68% said that they felt they didn't have enough protected planning time. Now, these are results from teachers, but we found that school leaders by and large agreed and that actually that was really consistent across the states and territories, public, private, high SES, low SES um, communities, these results were really, really consistent. In terms of how we've put this together, hopefully in a format that's useful for principals, um, we've chunked it up into these four reforms, which we're going to hear some concrete examples from tonight. Um, those four themes, which you can read about further in the guide, are prioritising and allocating resources strategically. Time is the most scarce resource in schools, so thinking about how student and teacher time is used is really important. Uh, letting teachers teach, so thinking about what uh, roles and responsibilities really require that teaching expertise. Uh, number three, working smarter, so reducing unnecessary things that we may not need to do, but also working smarter and more efficiently in some of those core things like curriculum planning. And then number four is reorganising teachers' time and thinking about how it's allocated. The last thing I will say is just to acknowledge that change is not easy and schools are very complex, complex and large organisations. We, we took a little look at some of the ABS data just to provide a point of comparison. And, you know, just looking at gross income, you know, your average primary school has a gross income of $4 million, which is larger and more than 93% of Australian businesses. And your average secondary school is 14 million, which is more than 98% of Australian businesses. They also have really large headcounts. We're asking the, them to deliver a very complex service. So change in these kind of organisations is not easy and we're definitely not here to say that it is, um, but it is really, really important. And so that's why it's exciting that we get to hear from a number of school leaders this evening who can tell us a bit about the journey and experience in their schools. I am going to, I do have a few slides, but I'm going to stop stop sharing so we can see everyone's faces uh, in between when people see some slides. Um, that's it from me, though. Oh, excellent, Amy. That was uh, very, very interesting, and I think it's very comprehensive. I'll start. Um, being the moderator, I probably get the chance to ask uh, one question first. Uh, you've been a secondary teacher, and we've chatted off air about your experience there. Um, in terms of uh, workload and the pressure on a teacher, what was your own personal experience back then? You have caught me red-handed. I have been a teacher. I taught out in um, out out west in Melbourne, and I taught English, which is obviously. You know, it's always nice to teach a compulsory subject that every student has to do. Uh, and being a part of this project really forced me to reflect a lot on what my experience was as a teacher and what I, I what I could bring to understanding teaching now that I'd taken on a role outside of teaching, but thinking about the education system. I think one reflection I had was, gee, teaching is hard. Like there's no two ways about it. Uh, teaching is a really complicated and difficult job and it takes a lot of hours but it also takes a lot of energy so I can sit at a desk which I do a lot of my research will be at a desk um, for a lot more hours than I could standing in front of a class uh, another reflection I had just thinking about my workload was that uh, I, I wish I'd asked myself maybe a bit more explicitly and often whether the things I was doing personally were really going to shift the dial and that was going to make a difference for my students um, I think that there are the list is basically infinite of what a teacher could do, but there are a few things that I think back on now, you know, a lot of laminating of student certificates that maybe I didn't need to do at the time, but it does mean that individual teachers are making these decisions all the time about what to prioritise and use their time for. I think the, the other thing that I've been thinking about is just, and I think this conversation tonight will get to it, but just some of the like I don't want to sound bad, but boring realities that make a big impact on an individual teacher's workload. So I was an English teacher, which, you know, I did a lot of secondary English teaching, which has a high workload in terms of marking. But, you know, other decisions that we made, like, okay, we're going to teach, we're going to change text or teach a new text in a particular year level. 
that's a whole new area of curriculum planning that we have to do um, that, that we might not have to do if we kept with the same text. Uh, also, if, if you've got a number of different classes like um, teaching year seven, eight, nine and ten English, then you have four different preparation areas. Whereas if you have the opportunity to double up, then, then that's one less preparation area that you might have. So there's a lot of very day-to-day -day decisions about how we structure teachers' work that will have an impact on their workload as well and vary across different teachers too. We should have you back in teaching with all that wisdom in there, Amy, and maybe one day we'll be able to talk you into it. Um, the other panellists, uh, Reid, you were nodding a lot there. You uh, nodding in agreement. I presume you may or may not have a question. Um, I was just going to ask about, um, you, you talked before, Amy, about a wide range of, of respondents from different groups and there's quite a consistent um, makeup in terms of the responses that you had um, from different uh, groups. Was there anything in, in the responses that you got that surprised you a little bit as, as a teacher when you, you, you watched that information come back from the survey? Yeah, I think that there were a lot of things that um, felt like, okay, this is maybe what we expected to get. But some of the things where we were surprised in terms of the time saving that we felt like teachers, teachers often we were looking for, okay, what's an option for something that could be changed in a school and did teachers feel like that was a good option? So we wanted to really test out potential reform areas. One of the ones that surprised, surprised me was just, for instance, we asked about um, the level of agreement if, if teachers had access to shared high quality curriculum resources did that think did they think that would save them time and 88 percent of teachers said yes that would save them time but they also said you know on average about three hours a week and we found that really really fascinating because um, we, we were worried that they maybe didn't have access to high quality curriculum resources already but three hours a week is a, a lot of time in a teacher's week so it was a really good opportunity. And, and that's something that we're following up actually in our next piece of research as well. So there's more to come on that topic. Mm, you made the point. It's funny how time is one of our most precious resources and it's one that can escape from us as quickly as possible there, Amy. Um, Adam, have you got a question? Well, it's sort of kind of building on what Reid said if um, you talked about um, what surprises you, but what excites you from this research that's come out? I think what excited me, and <laughs> maybe this is maybe this is a, a, a an obvious answer, but what excited me most has been the case study work that we've done with different schools and understanding how they've set themselves up for success. It's really made me think that these complex problems that happen in schools that are really important for student learning there's a lot of really smart people already thinking about it. And there's a lot of great practice that's already happening in schools that we can share. And I think one of the excellent things about the position that Grattan's in is we're able to kind of go into schools, uh, ask them what they're doing, do a piece of research and then talk about it publicly and have events like this where others are able to learn from what's happening already in schools. Henry, I think you're on mute. I am. A lot of people would like to keep me muted at times. We <laughs> uh, love you to unmute. Muting myself, yes. Oh, well, there you go. I've made people. Sonia, have you got a question before we ask you to do your presentation on Elevation uh, School? Reed took the words right out of my mouth. But thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Well, on that note, well, thank you for that uh, that that excellent overview, Amy, and Q and A. Uh, the answers were were, were, were really uh, special. Uh, Sonia, now that we've got you here, you've um, you've avoided the question questioning of Amy, but we're really looking forward to how your school, uh, Elevation Secondary College, or the AP there, has used support staff to ease teacher workloads. Um, thank you. And if Amy does return to teaching we're hiring so um, that would be great too. Um, yeah so I work at Elevation Secondary College it's just one of many new government skill, schools built in Victoria and growth corridors every year. I'm not even alone on this panel um, like there's another new school um, on the panel as well 
So um, we opened in a new housing estate in Melbourne's outer northern suburb of Craigieburn in 2020. And we started with one year level and then we're just adding one year level each year. So we now have about 500 students and go up to year nine. And we reflected that we just completed our first whole term of school um, in three years. So the community that we serve is also very new, uh, just like us. And the demographics change slightly with every new year level that we add. But what we do know is that our school has a significant proportion of students with refugee and migrant backgrounds. We have a large number of uh, families from Iraq, a very large number of families from Iraq, but also Turkey, Afghanistan, India, Pakistan, and um, just about 80% of our students have a language background other than English. We also have about 3% Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. Our families are highly aspirational and our data tell us that they have higher educational attainment than similarly disadvantaged schools, but they also face underemployment, unemployment and trauma. So our school is a pretty complex setting and we know that we have to work really, really hard to meet our community's expectations. Um, they want our school to deliver much better outcomes than the postcode or demographics of our school predict. Um, and that means our teachers work very, very hard to support and engage our students on top of teaching and learning in classrooms. Um, Amy, I think I'll need the slide a bit later on, but I'm okay now. So yeah, we have lots of case management, lots of behavior management, lots of parent meetings, but also lots of opportunities. We're running chess clubs, we're running school band, we do homework club, um, literacy interventions, accelerated programs, my fellow assistant principal, Kyle, he spends most of his time helping students tie a tie before assembly. Like we do all of it. Um, and we would not be able to do what we do if we didn't trust and invest in non-teaching or educational support. And I'm going to refer to them as ES staff to perform tasks instead of or alongside teachers. Um, and that's really the case study that I'm bringing to you today. So I'm going to talk about what our ES staff, education support staff do instead of teachers and what we've been able to achieve by freeing up um, teachers time. But I also hope to speak to you about our overall approach and culture that can allow that to happen because I actually think that's um, the biggest challenge. So you'll see in the um, reports principal's guide that we have education support staff taking part in homework club, yard duty supervision, student support groups, parent phone calls and meetings that are traditionally only performed by teachers. And with that teacher time saved, we've been able to run weekly in time, uh, like in the timetable curriculum planning meetings for all subject teams. Um, and that happens in addition to teachers' weekly professional learning community or PLC meetings, which are also in subject teams. So that's one to two hours a week of extra planning and collaboration time. So even in a high need school, we're able to give teachers more time to plan lessons and collaborate than many others. Um, so the how of this, the how to get ES taking on you know, traditionally teacher responsibilities, I think is actually deceptively straightforward. So you can already do this in Victoria. And I think the tutoring initiative in the wake of COVID has really highlighted the flexibility that is already in our system. Um, but I know that doesn't necessarily mean we all feel skilled and empowered enough to start asking our business managers to do a yard duty or an integration aid to run a recruitment panel, right? Um, I used to work in a very large government secondary school with over 1,500 students, and I am well aware of the defaults, the assumptions, the cultural barriers um, that there are to, to, to going about doing this. So um, I'm actually going to use examples of ES staff within our school to explain this, because I think that's the clearest way. And um, Amy will pop up the slide when I like give a name. I hope it's not too annoying for everyone. Um, so the first really important step to take is to lead with trust and a sense of investment in your education support staff, rather than just telling them to do more things. So we were really lucky as a new school with a very small number of teachers and almost equal numbers of ES. Like we kind of had this cultural jolt to work closely with each other and see each other as equal partners in education and see each other as professionals in our own right. Um, and it's a question that I think we should ask with ourselves. 
uh, ask of ourselves. How do we meet with our education support staff? How do we speak with our education support staff? You actually really have to get to know your staff to create opportunities and to, to show that trust and investment. So, um, for example, we've got um, a former integration aide, Kylie. Um, so she's on the slide. Kylie started at our school as an experienced integration aide who had spent years inside classrooms um, helping students with disabilities. And as the year unfolded, she shared that she would love, um, you know, she would love a bit of a change. So she wanted to try out office administration, maybe even a career change, try something new. Um, when it became apparent that our year level coordinators were spending significant time following up on student absences and out of form uniform passes, out of uniform passes, rather than like adding another teacher to the coordination office or telling the coordinators, too bad, so sad, like you've got to do more work, we engaged Kylie, who was an integration aide, to become our mini school administrative assistant and take over the phone calls, organisation and documentation that was inundating the teachers and year level coordinators. Um, we invested a bit of time and money in Kylie upskilling through professional learning, but we have absolutely made that back over the time saved. Um, and I think uh, the same goes for Nora, but I think I'm going to get a yeah, I think I've seen a question that I might answer about Nora, so I'll um, skip that. So, yeah, I'm sure I've got many principles in the audience, and I think the question to ask yourselves is, do you know your education support staff well? Do you know why they are working in schools? Do you know what their skills are? Do you know what their career aspirations are? Um, and when you actually start thinking in this way, you start to trust your education support staff more because you know them, you know their skills, you know their expertise, but you also become a lot more purposeful and creative when hiring new staff or resourcing a program. Um, and once you're in that stage, the second step I think is to ask, well, who really is the best person to do this new work or to, to do this piece of work? Is it necessarily a teacher? Um, as a new school every year, um, we're constantly bringing new staff on board. So we made the decision to hire two to three associates from La Trobe University's Nexus Teacher Program who take on one to two days of education support work in their first year of studying to become a qualified teacher. So they're university students who are studying to become teachers and we employ them for one day a week to be education support staff. They also have diverse experiences and want to be with students. So we've tasked them with everything from small group maths tutoring to organising our basketball competition. Um, so you can see Omar on the slide um, there. Um, Omar's just started doing that this year um, after leaving a career in engineering. And um, when we had a little extra EAL funding from the department, we hired Amal. Um, so Amal is a multicultural aide and we hired her specifically to communicate with families in addition to supporting students in class. So Amal really knows our teachers, uh, but importantly, she knows our students and our families really well. So she can draw her on her experience on coming to Australia from, from Syria to help students and families alongside, um, but usually instead of a teacher. And she's able to run those conversations with families on her own, again, saving us um, a lot of time. What I hope I've shown you today is that these might be, you know, we have many ES staff at our school. Um, the examples that I've given you are not uncommon, um, particularly in secondary schools. Um, maybe others can speak to primary schools. Um, when you get to know your staff, trust and invest in them, they really are open to more opportunities. Um, and our school couldn't function the way it does without the fantastic support of education support staff. So I hope that you try it. Um, thank you. Oh, excellent, uh, Sonia, um, very comprehensive. Um, we've got time for just one question. I was very interested in uh, Adam's question because it, it also leads into a, a broader issue. You might like to put that to Sonia, Adam. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering what are the consequences, both positive and negative, that you have when you have an uh, integration aid or ES staff on an interview panel um, rather than a teacher? Um, yeah, I think 
look, um, I don't want to give you the impression that you can just, you know, ask any integration aid to do a physics teacher panel or, or whatever it whatever it is and it's going to go swimmingly um, but it is that message again of matching skills and experience um, to the gaps that you have so I had Nora on the slides before you know she you know when you talk to her we found out she had a master's degree and she'd even run a large factory um, and done all these amazing things and um, she's actually an integration aide because she loves helping children she wants to go home after school and not think about her work day and, and completely switch off. And she wants to be with her grandkids after 3.30, but that doesn't mean she's not a fantastic asset to um, an interview panel. So yeah, as a new school, like we have to hire about 20 teachers and support staff each year. Um, and that that's common in Victoria. We're constantly on hiring panels, which in Victoria must consist of school staff and leaders. Um, but given her background, she's a fantastic asset to our panels and enjoys being on them from time to time. The downside, I mean, is obviously she works at our school as an integration aide and the ES still need to be covered for their time out of class. So another integration aide needs to step in for Nora when she's on an interview panel. Um, and you don't want to create a sense of hierarchy or favouritism amongst ES. You know, oh, she got to be on that panel. Why didn't I? Um, but that's where the trust and communication comes in and people are much less likely to feel imposed upon or resentful if they can think of like how their own interests and needs are being met or how the school is investing in them um, another way. And I should say the benefit is like the benefit far outweighs that. So a teacher or a principal would easily spend four to six hours on a recruitment panel for one job. Um, and so for every ES on a recruitment panel, that's four to six hours of teacher or principal time um, that is being saved. So I, when you do the cost benefit analysis, replacing an integration aid for a couple of sessions versus um, a whole, like taking a whole teacher off numerous classes, I think it's a pretty simple switch. Thank you for that, uh, Sonia. I notice we've got quite a few Q&A questions. I do promise you we'll get to those before the end of the program to, to our guests uh, that are with us, the, the many guests we've got. But now it's time for Adam Bright, Principal of Docton's Primary School and a fascinating case study. He shared curriculum planning and tiered intervention program. Uh, tell us all about it, Adam. Thanks, Henry. Um, Amy, if you want to check up my slide, because I will speak to that for the majority. Um, so as uh, Henry mentioned, we're, I'm our principal at Docklands Primary School. Uh, we have 441 students as of today, um, but there's 10 enrolment papers in my shelf behind me here. So we're 451 by Monday of next week, rapidly growing like Sonia's school um, and constantly employing new staff. Um, I suppose I want to talk a lot about tonight the work that we've done in our infancy in opening a school um, around developing high quality and shared curriculum resources and lesson plans at our school. And I've kind of, I suppose, stepped through the change management process on the left that we went through and that I, I went through throughout uh, this process. So you'll see, and I'll talk about some similarities and you'll, you'll hear um, or make some connections between the changes that you've led at your schools as well. Um, so I think the first step, for me when moving to, well, coming into this role and moving towards this thinking that we were going to develop these um, high quality shared resources was that I needed to form some really, um, some real clarity around the pedagogy and the way that I thought was the best way to teach um, curriculum at Docklands Primary School. So for example, I knew that I, um, from the research that I'd done, um, that I wanted to, our school to have a knowledge rich curriculum and, and by knowledge rich curriculum, I mean that our content would be specified in detail and we'd really spell out exactly what we were going to teach in the year levels. So for example, if instead of saying we're going to recognize and classify three dimensional objects, we'd actually um, specify those and say, we recognize and name a cube, a cube cuboid, rectangular prism, cone, um, cylinder and sphere. And with that, we get right down into the nitty gritty. Um, we then talk about um, knowledge as not just being merely encountered is actually taught to be remembered and we ensure that it's taught to mastery um, and that that knowledge rich curriculum is really sequenced and mapped it's really deliberate it's um, coherent and we look at our curriculum vertically and horizontally 
So having a real clear clarity around um, your pedagogy, that, that's really important starting point. Um, another example, so a knowledge-rich curriculum might be one example, but our sy synthetic phonics approach in early years reading is another example of being really clear and specific around how you think the best way to teach. What I was lucky to do then was to bring in expertise. So, um, and I had to think about not only the now in our early years of setting up the school, but then in the future. So um, I was really lucky to bring in staff like Amina McLean, who works at Docklands Primary School. Um, Amina's forgotten more about English teaching than I will ever know. So having some expertise within our school um, has been a real benefit to, to us um, and, our, and my colleagues. Um, you then need to do your research. So. For example, I knew that a synthetic phonics approach was how we're going to teach early years literacy. Um, there are many programs out there. So we needed to talk about the benefits and the consequences of each program. Um, and we investigated many. And for us at Docklands Primary School, we set it on Sounds Right. You then really need to understand what that will cost you from a budget perspective. So from training up your new staff for us for um, develop or um, sourcing all the decodable readers that we'll need in our prep to two sector of our school. Um, so there's a lot of research that you need to do around what specific program, then how much it's going to cost you so that you can financially plan for that. Uh, in some settings, but not when you're launching a brand new school, you get to trial the program. So um, this year we're trialling a program, for example, a prime mathematics program, but in our first year we didn't get to trial the program. But it really, when you're in an established school or when you have the opportunity, having that early adopters trial the program um, and then having the opportunity to sprinkle that success throughout your school and celebrate that really does gain some momentum throughout your school. So I think that's really important, which leads into my next point, which is that that then gives you the opportunity to iron out the creases that you might come across. So um, undoubtedly, there'll be issues when you're trying to roll out a program or some shared curriculum across your school, but trialling that means that you can identify these before you go whole school. Um, and those creases can sometimes be things that derail an initiative when you're trying to launch it. So having that opportunity to trial a program really helps that um, and helps you develop really clear guidance around how this initiative or this program is going to be rolled out. Um, we would then got to a stage like in Prime that I talk about when we roll that initiative out across the whole school. Um, the example that I talked about before in our synthetic phonics program that we use sounds right meant for us that we really needed to um, upskill all our staff so that our, all our staff receive the training from the source at Spelled rather than them receiving a um, drip down version of the program that someone went to do that PD four years ago and then they train up the next group of teachers and they train up the next group of teachers and before you know, um, you have a lethal mutation of that program. So we really make sure that our teachers go and receive that training from the source. And again, that comes back to that planning stage of how much you need to plan for your budget. Um, and during that rolling out of the initiative, we're also planning out and then the, the purchase of that resources as I've talked about before. The next piece is about supporting staff. So um, we, like I said, like Sonia, we have many new staff that start all the time at Docklands Primary School. So a key part of this is our staff induction. So we have quite a rigorous staff induction program where they're assigned a mentor that works within their team. Um, there's that formal training that I mentioned as well. Our instructional coaching model is something that we're really proud of at Docklands Primary School. Um, so we have instructional coaches that work um, within our school um, coaching staff in their classrooms and providing support and guidance in their classroom. Um, our, our instructional coaching model is, is blended in that we have some coaches that come in that don't have a face-to-face -face classroom allocation. So like Amina that I mentioned or like Ron Rory Jones that works at our school, um, they come in and they're coaching with our teachers the whole time that they're here. Um, our learning specialists, though, they um, predominantly teach face-to-face -face with a group of kids and they also have an instructional coaching load as well. So, And we see great benefits of them doing the work with the teachers and, and from the ground up as well. Um, we have weekly workshops or professional learning every week that's embedded into the way we do things as well. 
Um, we have learning walks where our leadership go in and provide uh, and get a snapshot of what's happening in our school. Um, our teachers all co-plan. They receive frequent feedback from the other teachers in their in their teams around um, the units and the lessons that they're planning. And there's that constant refinement of our lessons as they seek that feedback from their teams. And, and even if they're not seeking it, they'll get, get that feedback from their team as well. Um, and then finally, our work now is just to, and like with any change or program or initiative, is to embed that change. So we're looking to make it the norm. It's just the way things, we, the, just the way that we do things around here that we teach uh, sounds right in, as a synthetic phonics approach in PrEP2. Um, like I said, we induct our new staff. We monitor the change um, through our learning walks. And then we really work on tracking our student data to determine the effectiveness of our, of our initiatives and our programs. So, um, yeah, like I said, that's, there's many similarities between any change management process that you go through, um, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of guidance around how that we've, um, and myself, have chosen to lead this at Docklands Primary School. Um, along the right, there are many of the resources that we've used. And um, like I said, there are so many out there and you have to look at what's best for your context and best for your um, cohort. But we know there's a whole host of evidence behind these programs that we're um, using in our school. And so I knew that um, principals would probably like that list of and what someone else is using that working in this space. That's what we're using. Um, hopefully that can be a benefit to you. Thank you for that, Adam. Now, time's on the wing. We do have an interesting question here, um, Adam, from Emily Brooks. Thanks, Adam. Great ideas. Interested to know if you have interested to know if you have a particular coaching instructional model uh, in operation at your school. Yeah, we we um, some of our staff have gone off and done the recent gym night um, coaching, so um, training. So. Um, we're big fans of Jim Knight's work, and um, so they've, our two learning specialists have recently gone away and um, completed that training. The challenge for us is we have that blended model that I talked about where some of our staff come in on Mondays only, where some of our staff are here for the full week. So we're using um, the work of Jim Knight and the impact cycle to guide and develop an instructional coaching model that will fit Docklands Primary School. Um, as I said, we opened it. I don't know if I said this. We opened at the start of last year. So all this work for us is in its infancy. Um, and our instructional coaching model is certainly one of those pieces. Um, but yeah, we Jim Knight's work and the impact cycle is what we're guiding our work on at the moment. Oh, thanks, Adam. We're moving on. Uh, we've got a tight schedule. And I noticed John Neves, among a number of other people, have got some very interesting, uh, I guess, uh, philosophical and um, big picture questions. We will get to them as best we can in the time remaining, but we'll move now to Reed Smith, who's the head of curriculum at Ballarat and Clarendon College. And uh, Reed's uh, looked at uh, this uh, through their case study from a diary approach and school-wide calendar approach to managing time. Uh, welcome, Reed. Thanks very much, Henry. I'm, I'm really excited to be here chatting to you and the team about some of the things that we've been working on at Ballarat Clarendon College. Um, just for a bit of context, we're an independent uh, school in regional Victoria. We've got about 1,600 students from three-year-old kinder through to year 12. Um, we work across three different campuses and we have kids that come to us from re regional Victoria, from both Ballarat and uh, a wider range through our boarding houses. And we also have kids um, who are coming up on train and public transport from the outer western suburbs of Melbourne. So we've got a, a great range of kids that are that are working and learning alongside us um, at the moment. And really, I wanted to talk to you about this idea of the time that we have in classes and the time that we have at school. And, and Amy, you can pop the slide up whenever you like it. We feel that the most precious and limited commodity that we have as teachers, as a school is instructional time. So that's the time that we have with our kids, either in classroom or during that school time. And sometimes it feels like we have this massive amount of time available to us. But when we start to break it down, we realise that actually we don't have that much time. And we've got to think really carefully about what it is that we do with that time because there are so many different things we could do. And all of these different things have great utility and learning and they have great value 
and yet we can't do it all. We could literally build decades worth of schooling with the things that, that are going to be of great value to our kids, but we actually don't have that much time. And so what we felt we needed to do as a school is to be a little bit more intentional about the decisions that we made around what our kids were experiencing and what they were learning during the school day. Um, and before we embarked on this, this process of examining that use of time in school, that the decisions that we made about how we use that time was being made in various parts of the school and often with really limited knowledge of some of the other events and priorities of other parts of the school. And the really important thing, I think, for us to reflect on at, at this point is that the the different events that were going on for performing arts or for PE or sport or English or heading off to assemblies or where we get people to come in and talk about aspects of health and well-being, they, they all have this real value for our kids. But the problem we were facing is that the decisions about these these things, are, I'll, I'll call them events, I guess, is that they were being made in isolation. We weren't necessarily considering the combined effect of all of these different things that our kids were being involved in. And, and the impact that it was having on us as teachers is that you'd be sitting down one day and you'd realise that, oh, gee, I've lost four of the last 10 lessons that I was meant to have with my Year 7 English class. And, and and, and now I'm a week and a half behind the other classes that, that teach Year 7 or, or I would be meticulously planning the next two weeks' worth of learning for our kids. We know we've got just enough time to fit everything in and then all of a sudden something would come across our desk and say, well, sorry, we've got this event that's, that's popped into the calendar and it's going to impact your class with period three and, and all of our plans go all right. So as a result, we set out to create a system where we could make informed decisions, better decisions about what our kids would be involved in and have a bit of a think about what the impact would be on that in-class instructional time and for particular students and particular year levels. And our method for doing that is a combination of this thing that we call calendari and stepping out. And I'll just explain a little bit about how those two work. Now, calendari, don't get too excited. It's, um, it's an outlook calendar of events. But really, the importance of calendari is it's the process by which we develop the calendar that's really important. So a year ahead of time, we start work on our calendar. So we're already starting work on the 2023 calendar, which essentially is a list of all the different events that occur at our school, things that our kids are involved in, times when they're on off campus, times when we've got people from outside coming on campus and we've got assemblies or presentations, all of those sorts of things are rolled into this thing that we call calendar. And to put the calendar together, we invite heads of school, the head, heads of performing arts, the head of sport and, and different people who, heads of boarding house, people who represent groups of teachers and parts of the school, we we'll meet together in these calendar meetings where we discuss week by week, day by day, what our kids are going to be doing. And it's a real opportunity for, for us both to advocate on behalf of our particular part of the school. So it might be the performing arts department and the sorts of priorities we might have for the kids in our space, but also understand the other, um, the other priorities of, of other parts of the school and how we might be able to work together. And so this is a really important time because we get a bit of an idea, a larger picture about what it is that our kids are involved in. And if I'm a year six student, uh, what does my term two look like for the next year? And, and parts, uh, as we move through those discussions, we're really chatting about um, what it is that's most important. Are there things that maybe we can restructure and do in a different way, but still provide our students with a great opportunity for learning? Or maybe there's some things that unfortunately this time we're not going to be able to do given um, the other things that are on. Now, a lot of schools have something similar to that. Um, the, similar to our calendar, where you have that overview of what's happening in the school. But really, the second part of our solution is something that we call stepping out. And um, to understand the importance of stepping out, you need to understand our curriculum a little bit at Clarendon. And just like Adam was talking about at, at Docklands Primary, we have a knowledge-rich curriculum that we think of as, as a guaranteed curriculum. We know what it is that we would like our students to know and be able to do 
of the learning time that we have in each subject with each year level. We have a curriculum that's developed by our teams and it's been refined over time. And we've actually mapped that to specific lessons. So we actually know how many lessons we'll need to teach for each unit in each subject in each year level. We know what the course should look like. We know how much time it should take to teach that that particular course. And so what we can do is take that information that we've got from Calendary and we can start having a look at the way that it impacts on lessons. And Amy, you might need you might like to just slip to the next slide now. So here we have just a, a little screenshot of this thing that we call stepping out. And if you if you can imagine it's a scrolling sheet that shows every single lesson that we have in in a school year. So on the left hand side we have the days of the week. Um, I'm showing three and a bit weeks here, but it, it's, it scrolls all the way through to the end of the year. And this is showing four chemistry classes, and each chemistry class has a column of its own. And you can see that some of the lessons or some of the days are greyed out, and that means that there's no lesson on that day, that, that they haven't been timetabled the lesson. And then you'll see some that have some a description. In it. So, for example, on Thursday the 28th of April, um, 11 Chemistry A from the rates unit, it's lesson three and it's the temperature lesson. So we we know that on that particular day, it's likely that we're going to be teaching that temperature lesson. And you can see that there's a column for 11 Chemistry B, C and D. Um, on the stepping out, it takes into account the, if you like, the interruption. So where classes are cancelled or delayed because of events on calendar. So you can see in the column that's headed 11 Chemistry C, there's a black um, there's a black rectangle there uh, with elevate written on it. And that indicates that that class, um, 11 Chemistry C, they've lost a lesson because of something that's happening in the school. We've got the elevate crew who are coming in to work with the kids on that day. And what that enables us to do, this stepping out, is it enables us to see what the entire year looks like. So we can look ahead to to in any particular subject, in any particular year level, knowing the impacts of events that are occurring in our school, things that we think are going to be valuable, and how they affect different classes variably, because that's something that's important to us. And really, we're, we're looking to, to ask ourselves three questions. The first one is, do we actually have enough lessons in the year to finish the intended curriculum? So if we scroll to the end of the year, uh, do we have enough lessons? Or are there lessons spare at the end that we can reallocate to units so we have more time. The second question is, how do our units fit within a term? So when we look at how the lessons are being broken up, it's not ideal if we're, we're stopping a unit midway through that unit um, for, for a school holiday. So is how can we restructure or reorder our units? And then the last one, and this is a really important one, I think, for a lot of teachers, is if we've got classes that are sitting in different blocks, are they impacted differentially? So um, are, will you have one class that get, keeps getting affected because of events, they keep losing lessons because of different things that are happening in different parts of the school so that they may be a week or two weeks or three weeks behind another class by the time we get to the end of the year? And also a subset of that question really is if there are differences in the, in the impacts for classes, where that where is that occurring? Is it occurring in term one? Is it occurring in term three? So how can we manage that change? And if we find that there are problems with that allocation, so after Callum Victor has gone in, we've entered our stepping out, one of our heads of subjects has been through stepping out and they find that there's a problem, then we've got a couple of choices. We can alter our unit lengths or the order of our units. So um, can we alter the way that we've we tend for our curriculum to be structured so that it fits the time that we have. Thanks, we Lee. We're, we're um, probably running over time and we're trying to get a few questions. Uh, perhaps a quick summary there, Reid, and we'll get into some of our audience questions. No Thanks. problem, Henry. I'll just do the last two bits that we could do. You could also adjust the timetable. We have a rotating day one, so we can adjust what lessons are put on which day. And then the final one is we can adjust um, events on the calendar. So, Essentially, what we're trying to do is ensure the equity of class time and to make informed decisions about what it is that we do um, as part of our learning program. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Very detailed read and some great stuff there. Look, we've got a heap of great questions there, everybody. We're not going to get through all of them 
tonight, but I'd like to think that between the Grattan Institute and all of the people who are here, uh, some of these questions will be answered outside of today's uh, meeting. Um, I'll just pick a couple that perhaps summarise a few of the areas. This is for you, Amy, and I think it's a very good question about the efficacy of your, your study. Ask a teacher if they want, and this is from Dan Ingverson, ask a teacher if they want something to save them time and they will say, yes, do we have any objective data on this that would save time? That this would save time. Thank you so much, Henry. My, my sound just went out in the middle of it, but I think I can see Dan's question in the chat there. It's the one about the data on whether this could save time. Yes. Okay, great. So it, it was interesting in our in our survey, and it is a large scale survey looking at, and we did ask the perceptions of teachers. So how much time do they expect that they'd be spending and then what would save time? We're doing a bit more research in our next survey on how much time teachers are actually spending on particular tasks as well. The other thing we looked at, which we were really buoyed by, was a number of other studies that have been done. There's been a a fair bit of research in this area done by commissioned by unions looking into teacher time, but then also by other um, other organisations like AITSL who've released uh, uh, released new data as part of their ATDW data set. So we were really pleased to see that the data that we collected in terms of time spent and time saved and the things that teachers were spending time on seemed to align with what was in those other data sets. So that was something that we really were pleased by being able to triangulate that data. And we do definitely look at, you know, with perception data, how does it align with the other data that exists out there? Thanks for that, Amy. Um, and again, I apologise to those people whose questions we won't get to. There's so many great ones. But here's one from Graham Francis. Always fascinates me. It's about change, effective change management, which I think is at the core of what we're talking about here from Graham. I can see how the three case studies illustrate the three bold strategies documented in the Guide for Principles. Success all hangs on having high expectations of teachers working together collaboratively. Can Adam Reed and Sonia comment on how they changed or strengthened their school culture so that all staff accepted that they might have to work in ways that are very different to that which perhaps they're used to? In other words, the blockers. Uh, who'd like to speak? I might just chime in with one thing that I think is really important underpinning all of this. We've talked about how much time we've saved. A really important message to teachers for the culture is, so we've saved some time. How are we going to use our time to the greatest effect? So for our curriculum planning time that we freed up, um, we've got to take that seriously. This is not people sitting around talking about their cats and, you know, maybe marking a few assessment tasks and saying, look at this. Um, for our curriculum planning time, uh, we use the data-wise and meeting-wise approach. We have agendas. Um, we have, you know, maybe it's assigned pre-reading or people are bringing their marked assessment tasks or going through the unit, highlighting questions that they have. We've actually got to make sure staff are using the time um, that you're freeing up for them and you're making it really clear this time is for you and we're really investing in you. Um, and I think the other thing is with the new school, we're very lucky not just adding new staff, but also we have a young staff. We have many Teach for Australia associates, graduate teachers, and, and we really hope to define our culture as one where when you are um, at our school, you're giving it your best and you're spending your time collaborating with your colleagues and we take this time seriously. That's all. Thanks for that. We'll move on. We'll, we, we could have had something from everybody, but yes, change management at the end of the day means getting buy-in from everyone. That was an excellent answer. John Neves asked a number of questions that are really about the, uh, I guess, the way of Australia approaches education. Uh, and uh, some of them, I think we've all asked ourselves. I'll summarise with one of his questions. When will all schools in this country reach the required standards so that parents will no longer have to go school shopping. Uh, anybody care to have a go at that one? I guess we're talking here about uh, choice in education and the need for it. I uh, like Carol's response in the chat, um, Henry, where she mentioned that 
uh, I can read it if people haven't been, had the chance to read it. She said, possibly we'll stop prioritising high academic achievement, whether in private or public schools, when we decide that it is no longer necessary to produce high performing students who have the ability and motivation to go on to med or med science at uni and prepare for a career hunting for a better vaccines, which will benefit us all. Why in the world would we want to sacrifice our high academic performance? They are flatlining more in international competitors than any other group. If we offer them a mediocre education today, we can demonstrate it to a mediocre future tomorrow. That's what Carol said in the chat. Fair enough. Uh, one last one before we hand back to Amy Lee Johnson, um, a colleague of mine. So I will, I will, I will um, admit there to uh, a conflict of interest uh, from Lee Johnson. Are there many schools outsourcing their planning, scope, and sequencing and assessment preparation time by using Mappen or similar products? Uh, who'd like to have a go at that before we hand back to Amy? Yeah, well, that's part of what we I talked about in, in my case study, um, and that's the expertise that we bring in the school. So, for example, in English, Amina McLean, who's a speech pathologist, will come in and provide a lot of heavy guidance around what our scope and sequence should look like, what assessment tasks our teachers should be doing, and it saves our teachers a whole heap of time by doing that. So, yes, we are we're certainly doing that through our um, the expertise that's out there in, in the education setting in Victoria. I think the Excellent. other thing... Amy, we're getting towards the end. Um, it's been wonderful to date. I'm sure you'll finish yourself on a high note. Absolutely. And the point that I'll just uh, add to what Adam was saying was, whilst there's opportunities to take up resources like what Adam talked through that might be external to the school and developed elsewhere, and you talked a lot, Adam, about the training there is a real need and it takes a lot of effort, shouldn't be underestimated, for teachers to then understand, be aware and then be able to actually deliver and use those curriculum resources in a classroom well. So they're, they're, we do hear about schools outsourcing, but um, that we shouldn't underestimate the time it takes to actually use those resources well. Uh, I will just share up one last uh, slide for us just to take us home. And that is a couple of final call outs uh, for the audience. So we would love at Grattan, uh, if there's something that's prompted you tonight, please do take a look at that principal guide and think about what actions would make sense in your school context. We are really mindful that what works in one context won't necessarily always work in another. Time and time again, we've also seen that this work is not done on its own by one person. It's done with teams of teachers and school leadership teams. So really encourage everyone to be working with leaders, other leaders and teachers at their school. The, the third kind of call out we'd give, I did mention before that we're extending the research that we did through our earlier survey. We have a new survey. Uh, it's up live and you can access it via that QR code or the link just there. It's an anonymous survey. It takes about 10 minutes to do and we'd really love it. It'll be open during May. The final, final thoughts just from me are just a big thank you. Uh, thank you, Henry, so much for guiding our conversation. To Adam, Reid and Sonia for sharing your wisdom and being a part of the research uh, over a long period of time. And to our audience for coming along and being involved. It was great to see so many questions coming through. You would have noticed on a very final point, you would have noticed when you registered that there's an option to donate to Grattan. Um, you may or may not have done so. But if you are here, then I'm assuming you might like what Grattan does. And I'd encourage you to consider donating. We appreciate any donations, big or small. They make a real difference and allow us to keep doing this work. So that is it from us. I want to say thank you for your participation. Stay safe and have a good evening. Cheers. <laughs>